Production support for In Focus is provided by Smithville, a locally owned business serving central and southern Indiana since 1922 with residential and business internet, voice and security services. Smithville, local pride, global technology. Information at smithville.net. Hoosiers for Higher Education, a statewide organization for the alumni and friends of Indiana University dedicated to raising the awareness of the importance of higher education for Indiana citizens and the state's future. More information at 800-937-3448. Hoosier Energy, providing electricity for Central and Southern Indiana electric cooperatives and their member customers. Information at hepn.com. And by viewers like you. Thank you. The 2010 state legislature was touted as one with few major issues on the agenda, but the few which were touch many Hoosiers. Following votes at the State House, a referendum will appear on November's ballot regarding property tax caps. But the state still has not decided how to redraw congressional maps following the census. Tonight, we put the state legislature in focus. Hi, I'm Ann Shea, and tonight we welcome you to our March show. Our in-studio experts are standing by, ready to answer your questions, so email us at infocus at indiana.edu or give us a call at 1-800-987-9848. One of the biggest proposed amendments to this year's state constitution is implementing a property tax cap to give homeowners some relief in these tough economic times. But this proposed amendment also means critical cuts in funding for city government and public schools who rely on those tax dollars. Here's more on what this legislation means for Indiana. The Indiana General Assembly entered the 2010 legislative session with only a few large goals in mind, among them deciding on a process for redistricting in the state and votes on putting property tax caps into the state constitution. IUPUI political science professor Brian Vargas says while there are many questions on the table, the answers seem deceptively simple. The issue for Hoosiers is, okay, if I want schools, if I want roads, if I want all these things that are administered by these different levels of government, which get part of the property tax, uh, do they have enough money? Right now, they don't. It's, a, it's very simple. The cities and towns, and the, uh, the school boards, don't have enough money. I think we need a change. Where did you come up with one, two, and three percent? You tell me how you came up with those numbers. I can tell you how you came up with the one percent, there's more residential property, those are voters. So you're going to keep them the lowest. And then the farmers. Now, again, not picking on farmers, but they're at a 2% cap because they're business people too. You know, I, where do you draw those lines? And is it fair? Now's a time when government should be doing things, although people are saying, stop, don't do anything. When you do nothing, what happens? You go backwards. Fundamentally, if you want good services, they're public goods, you have to pay for them, and that comes out of taxes. Redistricting reform would affect the way Indiana draws its congressional boundaries after every census. But Vargas says lawmakers are of two minds. They must preserve their seats while amending the process. The fundamental issue about redistricting is Who's going to draw the lines? Should it be the party in charge? Should it be a nonpartisan group? Uh, should it be some special commission? Who's going to draw the lines? Because when they draw the lines for the congressional districts and also the legislative districts, uh, both the House and Senate, they generally tend to draw them to protect incumbents and to protect a, a particular party, the party who's in charge. Tonight, redistricting reform and property tax caps are among the items on the agenda as we put the state legislature in focus. And we wanted to find out what average Hoosiers think about property tax caps, so our staff hit the streets in various portions of our viewing area to find out. Marion County residents responded to the property tax caps and the impact it might have, and here's what they had to say. No, no, I don't think it's good to have tax policy through constitutional amendments. 
I don't know if the uh, law has been passed yet, but they're trying to put a um, constitutional amendment on uh, property tax. I think that there have been um, cuts made not only it's impacted the um, student to teacher ratio within classrooms, but programs have been cut. I mean, arts and music programs, students are having to pay for sports in certain situations. I mean, it really impacts children that come from um, not as wealthy homes. I mean, this is dealing with our kids, it's dealing with their youth. You need to have something that's stable so they know they can have something to depend on. Well, I think they're uh, a necessity. I mean, uh, the economy's bad, everybody's cutting back right now, so um, yeah, it's just something that it has to be lived with. It doesn't matter to me where it's funded. I think education needs to be funded, and I also think that um, all of the extracurricular, the music, your PE, your sports, all need to be um, involved in, I mean, you know, we need to pay for that. Good evening, I'm Stan Jastrzewski. We'll talk about those issues with Brian Vargas. He's an IUPUI political science professor. Thanks for being here. My pleasure. You've been watching the state legislature for a long time. Talk about the significance, first of all, of the property tax discussion that went on during this legislative session. Well, the issue this time w w was really very, very simple. It was whether they were going to put a cap on property taxes it's, and, and how they're going to write the constitutional amendment because it ab absolutely has to be voted on uh, by eventually by the public. It will be coming up. And that, what they were fighting about mostly this time was just the wording. And it's fairly simple and very straightforward. It would be 1% for residences, 2% for uh, uh, like rental properties and uh, agricultural land, 3% for uh, others and businesses so, and, uh, and personal property. And so there are a lot of people who are saying that the approval of this by voter referendum on the November ballot is a foregone conclusion. Do you believe that to be true? Um, it's, I'll be surprised if it's not approved because the, the, the situation is such that um, even though people can point to, as the, the people that you interviewed uh, and we just saw, could point to things in their school district, for example, and it's gotten even worse since then, the number of teachers and that have been cut out, uh, the number of programs, that still there's enough people in this state that see taxes as bad. I mean, they just, they, they see everything as waste. They don't realize that compared to other uh, industrial democracies in the world, our tax rate is like half that of some of, of the other ones. In our state per capita burden is, as I recall, somewhere in the area of the 23rd or something like that. And, and it, it's because this is basically a fiscally conservative state. And so talk to me then about what you think the motivation for a large majority of lawmakers to vote for putting this on a referendum was. Why would l legislators who ostensibly have all of this information about Indiana's tax burden go for such a move? Uh, well, they were all impressed. First, remember, th they meet in Indianapolis, and they were all impressed when now Mayor Ballard just o beat uh, Mayor Peterson, who outspent him 30 to 1, and was considered a very popular uh, mayor, but he built uh, the, uh, the stadium for the Colts, he built a cultural tr trail, a number of other things, and property taxes, remember there'd been the, the law case uh, up in Lake County that really said we have to assess them uh, much more equally according to our co constitution and there's been that spike in 2005, 2006. And when people saw people losing, like Peterson, who was well known in the legislature obviously, and, and in fact at the time he lost he was president of the National <laughs> Council of Mayors, uh, they started looking at it and saying, okay, this is a hot button issue. This All of is a sudden it's a political football. Yeah, it's, it's I, wanna, I wanna keep my seat. <laughs> you know, my party wants to win. Uh, we better start looking at this, uh, what a lot of people define it as almost a con con confiscation kind of tax because it, you know, it, most people who don't have their homes fully paid for, they have it folded into their escrow and their mortgage payment. Other people, however, and particularly when you get into some of the older population that are, tend to be on fixed incomes, they've paid for their house. The thing that they have to pay for is property tax bills. And after that course case, in many cases, they went up as much as 100% in some of the counties. 
And so they realized, okay, we've got to figure out a way to placate them. And the easiest way was let's put a uh, sort of, it's a little cap. It basically says you can only raise it so much, 1%, 2%, 3%, as I said earlier. Well, I'll tell you what, we're going to go and we're going to listen to some people in Bedford whom our staff found on the street, and we asked them what they thought of the property tax cap possibility. Well, I believe they're too high, but like I said, it's cheaper in Bedford than it is in Bloomington. Well, I know that they're having a big impact on local government, um, so I would be voting against it in the fall. I don't know. I'd really have to think about it. I'd have to know more about it. I don't, I don't know nothing, nothing about it. If it's for property owners, yes, I'm, I am for it. On rental property and commercial property, they're sky high. They're, they're very unfair. They're out of, way out of kelter. I tell you, I don't think they, they should be asking for any more. They need to learn how to spend what they're getting. Uh, I, uh, they're just highly inefficient.